<laughs> no, no plea. Thank you so much. It's lovely to be with you this morning. Um, lovely to see one or two dear friends coming in as well. It's great to be with you. Thank you for this opportunity. I count it as a great privilege to come and stand here. I would have worn a jacket, but I left it in the back of a black cab in London <laughs> before I left. So I apologize. It is a Jonathan Club one, though, this. This is actually, I bought this l last year. So and I hope, I, hope I, I pass the test. I think it's my third or fourth time coming here to speak. I appreciate the invitation, my dear friend Dave. Uh, and the wonderful um, uh, team here for this opportunity. Thanks for your leadership, your impact, your servant heart, and your uh, zest for life, Dave. It's great to be with you. A reading from the Gospel according to St. John, chapter 6, beginning at the 63rd verse. And it is Jesus who is uh, speaking. It is the spirit that gives life. The flesh is of no avail. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. But there are some of you who do not believe, for Jesus knew for the, from the first who those were that did not believe and who it was that would betray him. And he said, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted by the Father. And after this, many of his disciples drew back and no longer went about with him. I love that expression. Jesus said to the twelve, do you also wish to go away? And Simon Peter answered him, well, Lord, to whom shall we go to? For you have the words of eternal life. And we have believed and come to know that you are the Holy One of God. May the Lord bless the word to us this morning. I've been crossing borders for most of my life. I first slipped into the United States from a Vancouver Island on a passenger ship slowly tracing its way through the San Juan Islands as we watch the sun go down over the sea. And later I entered Quebec along a dusty dirt track. It was so peaceful that our solitary um, a car startled the immigration officer asleep at his uh, desk. <laughs> Yet crossing borders can also be an altogether traumatic experience. I once left China battling with a heavy cold during a bird flu epidemic and uh, futuristic heat sensors operated by expressionless guards pulled sufferers out of the line to quarantine them for a week or two. And on the Israeli border with uh, Gaza, as I crossed, we were once came under attack. The, the bombs were going off around us. As dust fell from the ceilings and the tables shook as a thud came down outside the crossing point, our guard looked at his computer and, uh, for a moment of panic and then said, oh, it's okay. He said, they're not very accurate, but they're getting better at it. Like some unresolved uh, refugee crisis, there are masses standing outside the community of faith, peering in, trying to decide if they're going to cross. Others have made the step but are uncertain about pressing further inland, unsure what it might hold, or wistfully looking back over their shoulders, wondering if they did the right thing. 
Over the years, I've walked with people crossing the border in both directions, coming in and going out, some in tears with the anguish involved. I've been there myself, moving among the people, pressing against the border. Some years ago, my own doubts were less intellectual and more practical. I'd made the crossing a while before, but now I was unsure if my faith could take the full weight of my stuff, my career, my battles, my doubts, my family situation, my health challenges, my plans for my old age, all of that kind of stuff, the demons, the personal stuff. Could Jesus, could my relationship with him take the weight of these issues. My problem is very stark. After years of identifying myself as a Christian, I increasingly would look in the mirror each day and wonder, have I really changed? I wasn't sure that I was actually becoming more like uh, Jesus, which surely is the point of the project of Christianity. Galatians 4.18 and following, My little children, for who I am in the anguish of childbirth until Christ be formed within you. If you have ever crossed a border, perhaps in traveling in Europe or between the states going north or going south, you'll have noticed all the various kiosks and last chance opportunities presented to you. Get your currency converted here. We have the best rates. Fill up your car, gas. The prices are good. Your last chance before you cross. Get your trinkets here, your souvenirs. It can be quite a tacky affair, actually. <laughs> Likewise, a whole industry has been set up along the border of the kingdom of God. There are sole traders and fr franchises that promise to get you over the line quicker, in better shape, and more equipped for what's going to come at you. Whole business. Much emphasis been, has been put by the church on getting people over the line. Some of these efforts have been very successful, but far too little has been invested in what on earth to do with ourselves once we have crossed. It would be nice if you were to become more like him, like Christ, but our contemporary construct for Christianity is that it's not really necessary. You've, you've crossed the line. All the rest is merely optional for those who like that kind of thing, you know, <laughs> who are into that sort of stuff. <laughs> Indeed, to pursue a deeper life with God, one that will actually change you from the inside out, well, that's viewed as rather superficial and unnecessary and rather self-indulgent. We've got more important things to do. And this gets to where doubt sets in. I thought the deal was that if I gave my life to God, he would see me and my family right. Or the haunting lament that I sometimes hear in private pastoral settings, God hasn't done well by me. It can be crushing. It can be crushing. I know I sometimes wonder if Christians were a bit more honest about their doubt, others might be a bit more honest about their faith. In a survey we conducted back in the uh, UK, we discovered that 25% of atheists pray. According to research from Pew released just before Christmas, 83 of Adults in the United States believe people have a soul or spirit in addition to their physical being. 
81% say there is something spiritual beyond the natural world, even if we cannot see it. 74% say there are some things that scientists cannot possibly explain. 45% say they have had a sudden, a, a sudden feeling of connection with something from beyond this world. And 30%, 30% of people living in America say they have personally encountered a spirit or unseen spiritual force. In his book, Varieties of Religious Experience, the philosopher and psychologist uh, William James, who died in 1910, told the story of a school child who was asked to define faith. Oh, that's easy, said the child. Faith is belief in something you know isn't true. <laughs> and here is where the fundamental category mistake is made. We see faith as irrational, non-logical, the opposite to reason beyond the most serious and rigorous debate. How did we get here? How did we, get, how did we allow that to happen? Our reading today speaks of this. A number of followers of Jesus are standing on the border of faith and doubt. It was a defining moment in Jesus' life here on earth, the ministry he had. He asked them directly, looking at them in the eye, will you also turn away? Maybe he's asking that of us too, or someone we know, a spouse, a child, an adult child perhaps. Then Peter responds, well, where would we go? Who would we turn to? Now, that's not a bad a question to ask, because wherever you go, you're still going to have to deal with your stuff, my stuff. The, transcend, the, the uh, transcendental question about the source of beauty, truth, and goodness. Where did it come from? Along with the age-old questions of who is a good person? Who has got it made in this life? How do I become a good person? And the ultimate one, the big one in the room, what is real? Reality. These questions remain wherever you stand. And when I come to Brentwood, I like to quote the famous world-class philosopher who lived in your town, Dallas Willard, who spent a decade as a leading global professor at USC. He passed away more than 10 years ago, but he observed this. Doubt is one of the most direct ways to get to reality. And we're in the reality industry. Doubt is, the, is the most direct, one of the most direct ways to get to reality. What he meant was that doubt and faith don't need to be sworn enemies. So we would do well to pick up our doubts and to work with them and not be intimidated by them. And Willard also said, you don't have to be certain about anything you're not certain about. Certainty is not something you can choose. And we have this whole, I haven't got time to go into the whole thing about, you know, don't doubt, you know, just, just clench your fists. And then to drive his point home, he said, it's possible to go to heaven with a lot of doubt. And people are doing it all the time. We need to give ourselves permission here. So what I suggest we do in response to doubt is to stop hanging around on the border. And there is 
more, there are more than enough, there's, there is more than enough intellectual capital around to substantiate a strong and stable belief in God. Public intellectuals like, I don't know, David Brooks, perhaps, or the editor in chief at Bloomberg, John Nicholf Thwaite, believers, public intellectuals believe in God. Don't, don't tell me there isn't strong, a strong case, an intellectual case for belief in God. Much of the doubt debate re revolves around admissible and inadmissible evidence. A small child, generally small children, have a latent belief in God. Yeah, but, but don't you understand, they're just kids. The vast majority of the world, the vast majority of history has believed in a transcendent and the divine. I know, but you see, the rest of the world aren't as educated as us. People are having spiritual experiences all around us. Yes, but they're not have it, having them in my church under m the ministry I have, using the words that I'm expecting them to have. We don't v v validate the fact that people are having spiritual encounters. What is admissible evidence in this debate? You tell me what's admissible, I'll tell you what the outcome of the debate will be. Because it's what are you allowing in and what are you saying you can't include? If there is no God, then please don't tell um, um, Handel, Mozart, Beethoven. If there is no God, please don't tell Rembrandt or Vermeer or Van Gogh, or Picasso. Our art galleries and our music libraries would be pretty thin without these people who believed in God, yeah? The Spanish mystic and religious reformer, Teresa um, um, Avila, who died in 1582, described the spiritual life as a series of uh, rooms in the interior castle. We have an interior, and she likened it to a castle, and she likened it to seven movements. You can move through chambers in your interior a, a castle. Now, she's not the only one to write about this. The popular writer uh, Richard uh, Raw, in his popular book, Falling Upwards, is talking about the first half of life and the second half of life and how things change. What was important in the first half of life doesn't seem so important. You move on to another set of issues. Or the sociologist in his celebrated book, The Stages of Faith, in the framework of Teresa Avila, she talks about these seven um, you know, stages. And I'd suggest to you that we're living, many people are living in sort of room number three. What does that mean? This is where we give our lives to God and he does right by us. We recognize a high degree of answered prayer we get caught up in the worship in church or on audio. Our faith seems so uncomplicated. Perhaps as a student, there was those days. The Christian scriptures are of great value to us, meaningful speaking. It is in some senses a transactional relationship with God. But then these consolations of faith Faith. They're sometimes called the consolations of faith, answer prayer, numinous experience. They're sometimes called a gradually withdrawn, and we get confused, and we worry, have I done something wrong? Is there something r wrong in my life? Do I need to change? You know, what's, what, what's going on? Or doesn't it exist? It doesn't seem so clear anymore. It's not so easy. And we get very confused and very upset and tr troubled. 
But I want to suggest to you this morning that this isn't a crisis, this is an opportunity. An opportunity to deepen our faith, not to lose it. Like one of the scenes in a C.S. Lewis story, we find that we can't turn back the pages. I'll just go back, I'll just go back. The pages won't turn back, they only turn forward. We can only go on. Who will show me how to press ever further into the kingdom of God? Who will show me? Who will teach me? Who will tell me what's ahead? Who will help me move into an ever deeper relationship with him? Perhaps in the beautiful community of this church, in the company of others, we can help each other. And finally, a poem, Staying Power, by Jeannie Murray Walker. It's the, the poem says, in appreciation of Maxim Gorky at the International Convention of um, um, a, um, um, in 1929, and Gorky was a Soviet author that Stalin loved because he espoused the concept of building an atheist replica of God. Yeah, we want the trappings, but we don't want the God. It's like the um, present I got yesterday. Everything but the bagel. Have you come across this? You get the everything bagel in um, her Starbucks and Trader Joe now has a little jar and it's called everything but the bagel and what they were doing in Soviet Russia was doing everything but the bagel here's the poem like a gawky I sometimes follow my doubts out to the yard and question the sky longing to have the fight settled, thinking, I can't go on like this. And finally I say, all right, it's improbable, all right, there is no God. And then as if I'm focusing a magnifying glass on dry leaves, God blazes up. It's the attention, maybe, to what isn't there that makes the emptiness flare up like a forest fire until I have to spend the afternoon dragging the hose to put the smoldering thing out. Even on an ordinary day when a friend calls, tells me they've discovered melanoma, complains that the hospital is cold, I say, God, God, I say, as my heart turns inside out, pick up any language by the scruff of its next and you wipe its face and set it down on the lawn and I bet it will toddle right back into the God fire again, which, though you say it doesn't exist, can send you straight to the Burns unit. Oh, we only have so many words to think with. Say God is not a fire. Say anything. Say God is a phone, maybe. You know, you didn't order a phone, but there it is. It rings. You don't know who it could be. You don't want to talk. So you pull out the plug. It rings again. You smash it with a hammer till it bleeds springs and coils and clobbery bits it rings again. So you pick it up and a voice that you love whispers, hello. Lord God, help us with these issues and help us to find our way back to you, our heart's true home. Amen.